haven't met me, I'm Melanie Smallman and I'm from the Department of Science and Technology Studies at UCL. Um, and myself, Steve Miller, Marilyn Bowers, who I've lost somewhere, and Jack Stilgo, we've been the team that have been leading on the training and advocacy programme. And so I don't want to necessarily say much about what we've learned as trainers, largely because um, I think many of us are still in the middle of it and are still uh, kind of experiencing the full thrust of the training programme or, or delivering it. But what I want to do is talk through some of the things we've done. I hope that for um, those who haven't been part of the project, it will be an interesting celebration of what we've achieved. And similarly, for those who have been um, delivering the training, I'm sure it'll be a trip down memory lane, a celebration. And for those of us who haven't seen our families uh, since this time last year, it might be some kind of therapy or closure from that wonderful experience. Um, and I just, I mean, I think that both Nacho and Jacqueline have given a sense of when we started this, we had strong ideas of what we needed to do, but we didn't really know how to do it. So, you know, there was a lot of confusion, a lot of questions, a lot of discussion, a lot of arguments right at the beginning. And that actually was even just within the UCL team, most of the arguments. Um, <laughs> we're, we, have, we have robust discussions. Um, but I just wanted to go right back to the beginning. And these were the kind of things that we were asked to do. Or this is what we promised to do right at the beginning of the project, was that we were going to deliver a training and advocacy programme that will kind of encourage people to use the toolkit right across the European member states, which just seemed like such a huge task. And we were very clear right from the start that the training we wanted to do wouldn't be a traditional um, teacher in the front with everyone listening like you are now, I'm afraid, but that we wanted to work with case studies in a very interactive way to help participants find a solution of their own. So we were really clear that Ulrike's point that this shouldn't be a tick box exercise or we shouldn't turn it into a process that can be either completed or handed on to someone else. That idea was right at the heart of what we were trying to do from the very beginning and that we wanted the trainer to guide the participants through the processes. So we've had a lot of discussions and a lot of, lot of conversations rather than, you know, sometimes it hasn't, sometimes I felt like the one being trained actually. Um, so, yeah, just going through a chronology of what we did. So way back in autumn 2014, as Jacqueline talked, we did um, collectively this pan-European consultation where we spoke to 411 stakeholders across 22 different countries. So in each country, we carried out the same workshop, the same kinds of stakeholders had the same kind of conversations, all within two weeks of one another. Um, and it turns out that it was, well, so far it has been the largest consultation on responsible research and innovation in Europe so far. Um, and coming out from that, we produced our, that's quite a boring picture, our report, which we call D2.2, but we analysed what it was that people had talked about. So what the opportunities, um, obstacles and needs were of the different stakeholder groups. So we had these nice bubble diagrams which illustrated what we'd found. This is all, I think, still on the RI Tools website. So if anyone is interested in what we found, it still is pretty interesting. Um, the key thing is that what people told us about what they thought were the obstacles, what they needed, went on to form the basis of both the toolkit and the training. And they were very positive, I should say. So. Um, this year, no, not this year, 2015, that's even last year, I'm already lost where we are. Right. 2015, after we'd reflected on what we needed to do, it, the question was, how do we think about RRI in practice? So what does it look like? How do we describe it? Um, and as Jacqueline said, Athena developed a series of criteria for responsible research and innovation, and then a catalogue of 40 promising practices, which we then worked together with... Uh, partners across the consortium actually to develop the eight showcases and these showcases which are also on the tools website we went into a lot of detail to actually describe how RRI was being enacted in different situations and the idea is is that these showcases form the basis of training so they both document 
what has happened in practice, but also provide a series of kind of questions and activities um, that you can use with groups in order to um, train. So we've got, you know, just a couple of examples. Um, the, it's the Challenge Driven Innovation Project from Vinova. So the, we've got a story about the Portuguese fisheries project where um, the fishermen were actually involved in discussions about how to reduce sh uh, shark bycatch and so forth. Um, of course, the How To project, which um, we worked with at UCL, um, who has been shortlisted for the awards, so our fingers are crossed for them this evening, where they have worked with people uh, on the autistic spectrum to develop products both with them and for them, which has gone on to form a very successful international level business. Um, Skipping forward, 2016 this year has certainly been the year of the training. So we've had two Train the Trainer workshops where more than 100 members of the consortium came together and worked through the training material that we had all developed. And that has led to more than 90 training workshops right across Europe. Um, and I gather that they're still going on. So I know we've still got at least three in UCL and the other hubs have still got more to come. Um, we've also trained, so we've trained in the regional countries, um, but we've also carried out European level training with big organisations like the European Commission, the European Sci Citizen Science Association, um, CISNET, which is the network of science with and for society contact points, that's the word, isn't it? Um, IEMA, they're the research managers and administrators network. We were at ESOF this year, we've been at PCST and at Excite. So we've really tried to reach out far and wide um, to deliver our training across Europe this year. Um, the materials that we've developed, just to give a flavour of the kind of things that we do when we're training. So, I mean, things range from things like briefings and basic information that people can take away with them. I'm going to warn people that there's photographs of them coming up. Um, <laughs> there's, say, I mean, we've done interactive sessions on how to use the toolkit and getting people to engage and upload um, things like that. Then um, discussion workshops and kind of brainstorms where we've used lots and lots, I think the next picture, no, flip charts, and we've used the European supply of post-it notes over the past year, even more post-it notes. So I've had enough of post-it notes, but we've also done things, hey, with the hats, does everyone remember that? So we, we've done lots and lots and lots of, uh, we've tried to take as many different approaches and to actually make our trainings as enjoyable, some might say humiliating, but enjoyable as possible. <laughs> There's another one, don't worry, don't, don't. Um, so this was a particularly fun moment in February this year in UCL when Steve and I forced the consortium to go outside and I think it was snowing, it doesn't show up on the picture but it was just starting to snow and everyone had to pretend to be a different stakeholder and in order to identify which stakeholder they were they had to wear a different colour party hat but what you can't see is all of the UCL students sort of avoiding the weird people, the weird adults with the hats but everyone, yeah, everyone got into the spirit and we all had a laugh afterwards when we'd recovered from the hypothermia. Um, <laughs> But the important, I mean, I wanted to, that, that to remind me is that we're going to talk a lot about the toolkit and the website and the training materials and the things we're leaving behind. But actually, one of the key things that we shouldn't forget that we've left behind um, are the people with the skills. So above everything, we've trained more than 100 people to deliver really good and really intensive RRI training. So I just want to leave it on that and just, um, yeah, I, I just want to say one last thing because I forgot to say it at the beginning is that I'm so happy to see everybody. It's been a real pleasure working with everyone. I know we've worked really hard and some of the sessions have been a bit more exhausting than others, but um, for me, I'm proud and happy that we've done all of this, but I'm going to be super sad to say goodbye to everyone tomorrow. <laughs> I'll say goodbye now. Thank you.